Eric Hatch, today's guest, is a photographer and environmental activist who has photographically documented glaciers in retreat. His artistic photography show by that name is now touring the country. With the show, Eric hopes to inspire action on climate change. He'll share insights about his work and his superpower. I'm your host, Devin Thorpe. Welcome to the Superpowers for Good show, where we empower you. Eric, thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. I'm just thrilled to have you on the show. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I mean, you and I go back a ways. We we do, and uh, we followed one another, and uh, and I've seen you do some amazing things, and I'm as excited as I've ever been about your work now with uh, both your uh, work around glaciers, climate change, and your new memoir. So uh, wh where do you want to go first, glaciers or memoir? Oh, let's start with the glaciers. Okay. Okay. So you kind of, as a professional these days, do a lot of work around photo restoration, but you're a passionate photographer yourself. Uh, tell us a little bit about how on earth you have been able to get these meaningful artistic photos of glaciers. Well, okay. I like glaciers. I mean, period. I just like them. But I also realized, having shot some for a while, that I, what I really could do is document climate change in a way that gets to people's hearts. Because you see these photos and you are moved by them. You don't just get it because there's explanations and sometimes it's obvious. But you get it viscerally that this is a loss. And yeah. the importance of that is that's the only way people are going to get off their butts and do something about climate change. They have to feel it. Yeah, yeah. And so, so your goal really is not just to communicate information, but oh, to look, use no. use your medium as an, a form of art that connects with people on a more visceral level. That is exactly right. And this show has had one showing in Cincinnati. and. and one of the visitors to the show commented, tragically beautiful. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. What what a oh. painful insight. Uh, you know, Eric, I wonder if um if afterward maybe you could share a couple of these photos with me that I can put into the video and on the newsletter when we share this so that people can get just a little bit of a sample. Can we do that? Yeah, sure we can. You can go to a website too, glaciersinretreat.com. Okay. Um, great, great. We'll we'll make sure that people we'll see plenty uh, of glacier stuff there. Yeah, great. Um, well, I, I appreciate you sharing some photos with me, so we can incorporate that into the experience for people who are uh, listening or reading or watching. Uh, Eric, yeah. as you uh, have done this, tell us a little bit about where these glaciers are. How do you get up there? It seems like the you know uh you're not 22 you're not 22 anymore <laughs> how does no, the, how do you do this well very carefully there's really three ways you can can get at glaciers you can hike up to them you can hike hike up on them you can hike up beside them or you can fly over them and i've done all of those yeah wow. the hike up on them part i found very scary because my balance isn't as good as it used to be. The yeah, hike up yeah. Side part, that works. The fly over them part, if you know somebody with a bush plane, which I did, you get incredible aerials. Yeah, I can only imagine. You know, well, I look forward to seeing. I look forward to seeing your, your images that help convey that. Well, uh, it, it's amazing work. Uh, that you're you're doing and it's exciting uh where will the next show be do you have one scheduled yeah uh right it's just opening now in hanover new hampshire unfortunately only 11 of the 17 are being shown because they they didn't take the trouble to measure their space well ah <laughs> that's no too room bad at, you can't no room at the end for all of them yeah, uh, yeah. next showing is going to be starting about the 20th of august and run for probably two months in the Evendale, Ohio Cultural Center. Oh, amazing. great. Yeah. Uh, and great. after that, I don't know. And one of the things you and this show can do is find science museums that want to display this thing. Yeah, 
Yeah. I'm not charging anything except shipping and insurance both ways. That's great. That's great. That really helps to make this uh, accessible to more people. So thank you That's the uh, idea, for but, doing that. But getting access to, to the museums is not easy. Yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine. I can only imagine. As uh, as you think about this now, let's put this into a little bit of context. Let's talk about your memoir. Um what what it's called, I think uh, you wouldn't believe it anyway, anyhow. Yep, that's the title. And it's because <laughs> I've had such an incredibly rich and complicated life that well, you wouldn't believe it anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the title is, is really what's going on in the book. It's yeah. Let's go ahead. Tell us a little bit about your book, your life in the book. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the best way to do that. I, I'll I'll read you the opening paragraph. Okay. Just for fun. You want that? Please, please. Okay. I'll have to go. This is this is a dummy copy. Hold. Yeah. Uh, okay. Go ahead. No worries. Well, I can. I can tell you. Here's what. Here's what this book's about. And here's the first sentence. The atomic bomb went off and I arrived. With my left eye crossed, my nose pushed to one side and my head squeezed skinny. And so begins a lively, humorous memoir, which is guaranteed to cure boredom. I was one of yeah. the baby boomers. Uh, my mom and dad got a head start during the Blitz. Um, yeah. So I've created a book that's full of bucket list stories, real adventures in exotic places, colorful characters, and anecdotes from my widely widely traveled life. I mean, yeah, I yeah. The the writing really is spectacular. It, it's just so amusing, so fun. Uh, I was reading a little bit of it before we started, and um, you know, it's it's fantastic that that uh, you share in the opening chapter there a little bit about your birth and and its context and it struck me uh that your mom shared a secret with you tell us tell us about the secret and tell us about the uh her reaction to your reaction to the, okay. to the secret there's a story that goes with this so i'll do the story please uh, my father who was a very famous writer and a really big deal he wrote my man godfrey among other things um, and, you know, he, he was published everywhere. Saturday Evening Post. He, he was the New Yorker's first sports writer covering yachting and horse racing. My father was a steeplechase jockey. You can pump me. No, you can't see the picture up there. Oh, well. Um, <clears throat> so he, what he, he's 40 something. And what do you do if you want to get into the war and you're the U.S. Army and this guy's got. He's so well known, you don't want to put him at risk. He's too old to be a grunt. And you don't really want to commission him. So what do you do? And what the army did was they attached him to the psychological warfare division with the equivalent rank of lieutenant colonel. He was technically a civilian all through this. Um, <clears throat> so my mother was doing assignments. She was a captain in the WACs. And she met my father, who came into the office, and he asked her for a date. And she looked him up and down and said, I know who you are, and I'm not impressed. But I'm sending you off with Patton on Monday morning, and if you come back, well, maybe. <laughs> so X months later, he did come back reconnected with my mother whom he loved deeply for the rest of his life and uh, they didn't waste any time she was impregnated with me <laughs> the only problem was my dad already had a wife <laughs> oh no <laughs> they were separated and what i say in the book is she had to be gotten rid of no not that way just money <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh. So my mother told me about this when oh, I was 65 or so. 
And I, she was kind of ticked off when I sort of shrugged and said, okay, I'm legit. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but she was mad at that. Yeah. Right hand. She, she had felt that she had shared some deep secret with me. Yeah. And I didn't register it that way. Times have changed. It's a different yeah. world. Yeah, she she felt like she had protected you from this information for 65 years. Yeah. And here you. now, uh, upon sharing it, you were yeah. nonplussed. <laughs> no, I wasn't nonplussed. I was sort of meh. Yeah, yeah. I um, didn't actually say so what, but it was clear that. Yeah, that, that was interesting, clear. interesting. Well, she was a well, brilliant. She really was, you know. Nobody's stupid on either side of my family. And she was right up there. I, I, of course, drew you to this story because I had read it. But what? What? share another highlight from the book with us, if you could. Oh, Lord. Just one? Uh, let's see. Early, middle, late? What do you want? Uh, whatever. Think of one of your best stories. Well, were, <laughs> I like to think they're all pretty good. Okay. Yeah. We're going we're gonna to go into the middle of Alaska. It's hot as blazes in the summer of 2010. And I'm cruising around with the, in a Subaru Outback with my dog, two cameras, camping gear, and, ten, and God knows how many meals ready to eat, which I couldn't, we found I couldn't eat because they're only aimed at 20-year-old metabolisms. <laughs> yeah. You know, and not good for Eric. Right, right. So I stopped at a, at a cafe, and they had this big heat fan going, put air through the place. So I couldn't, I couldn't tape this. So I had to do it. I taped all these interviews that I did up there, but not this one. So I asked the girl to tell me her story, and she did. And I just, you know, I listened pretty well, and I said, well where should I go next? And she said, you should go talk to my grandfather. His name is Devere. And he lives in uh, Ferry, Alaska. Now, the thing about, she said, now, Ferry, Alaska is, is Bush, Alaska. You know there are two kinds of Alaska. There's Road, Alaska, and there's Bush, Alaska. Okay. And Ferry, Alaska is Bush, Alaska, but not by more than a couple of hundred yards. But you have to walk into it. Yeah. And you cross a railroad trestle, which you want to watch out doing. But anyway, uh, so I went to Ferry, Alaska. And there's a cluster of log cabins around, but no people. And my dog, Ginger, is sort of sniffing around. She's okay. And so I went, hey, they're here! And I did it loud. I'm a singer, and I have a big voice when I don't have our for problems like today. Yeah. So all of a sudden this door pops open and this little head pops out with a curly hair and a bushy beard. And he says, who the hell are you? <laughs> and I said, well, your granddaughter sent me to look in at on you and see how things were. And he said, oh, come on in and have a beer or a coffee if you prefer. It's 930 in the morning. Yeah. I said, I'll stick to the coffee. He said, come on in. So I did into his log cabin, which had a miniature grand piano in one corner, a baby grand. It had shelf after shelf of books. In other words, this is an educated guy. But he's also a sourdough Alaskan, which is what they call people who've been there for forever. And we just we just talked for maybe two hours, and he got antsy and was looking at his watch. And I says, "Devere, what's going on? Why are you so antsy?" And he said, "Well, the sewer to um, Fairbanks train, the sewer to Fairbanks train goes through here, and every day they drop a newspaper off for me, and I don't want to miss it." I said, "Okay, I'll walk out with you." So we walked out. And the train comes along and this paper comes flying through the air and Devere catches it and he can't wait. He looks at the headlines, he opens it up. I said, Devere, go read your paper. I guess we're done. <laughs> <laughs> and that's that story. 
Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, trumped by a, a newspaper. That's great. Well, yeah, well, but we had a great visit. I mean, I, oh, that's great. He was stumped at all. He was uh, he, guy. You've had a, an interesting, accomplished life doing so much. Uh, uh, one of your past projects was uh, 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 portraits of addicts, people we often look past or beyond or dehumanize in one way or another. And and you kind of got to that ahead of the curve. You know, in recent years, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, addicts and 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 we have become more comfortable with the idea that addicts uh, are not culpable for their situation. They suffer from a disease. Uh, and uh, so our our thinking as a people has changed a lot. But but you got there early trying to humanize uh, people who we often ignore. How did you come upon that project? It was the day. No, it wasn't. It was a year after Trump got inaugurated. And I was driving to see friends one um, in upstate New York and then on to Okimo to do some skiing with some classmates. And on the way, I was thinking, you know, you're kind of bored with what you're doing. What could you do that's different? And the first thing is make it about people because I'm primarily a landscape photographer. And what else could you do? What would make it sizzle? Black and white. Boom. And all of a sudden it came to me. I, what I needed to do was photograph addicted people, not for horror shots. That had been done. And actually, I didn't know about it at the time, but the other, the guy who did that yeah, did it in Time magazine, and his project name was Faces of Addiction. And by that mm -hmm. time, I'd already incorporated my name, so I got stuck with it. So I came up with this idea, and I went to see my friend Gordon Boyd, and he and his wife got all excited and said, go do it. And I went off to Okimo, and the guys at the ski house all said, geez, go do it. And some said, how can I help? So what I did then was a business plan. I, what was my goal? I wanted 50,000 people to see this in one form or another. And I think I made that. It's hard to measure. I know several thousand saw the exhibits live, and there were TV clips and other things. Anyway, um, so on the way back, I figured out what I was going to do. I was going to shoot between 35 and 50 pictures. 35 was the minimum. 50 was the stretch goal. I made it. Um, <clears throat> I was going to shoot in natural light, available light, wherever I could. And about 95% of the pictures were taken that way. No flash and no studio lights. I wanted, and the the method would be that we'd have a, I'd, I'd talk with them for maybe 20 minutes. You know, and this wasn't timed, it was as the conversation flowed. And I wanted to learn about who they were and what their story was, how they had come into being addicted, because there are a number of different routes people follow. And then somewhere in the interview, I'd just pick up the camera and, to start shooting with it, and we'd continue the conversation, but I'd be shooting. And of course, I model released all of it, have to. Mm -hmm. And I taped the interviews so that I came home and had the, you know, the full data set so I could write up these things. And what I did was the exhibit, which consisted of 50 pictures, black and white, 13 by 19, Framed in museum glass. I got a grant for that, thank goodness. Um, and then parallel to each picture was the story. I held them to one page. So viewers can go around and they can, can look at the picture and then they want to read the story. And I've, I've seen people doing this and their faces just are amazing. Yeah, yeah. Really humanizing people that, like I say, we so often ignore look past yeah that's the point that's the purpose now that yeah. i had five complete shows with five shows some partials some complete i'm 50 pictures 
plus 50 placards is a lot. Yeah, yeah. Take the physical space. The one place I put it was in the Ohio government, the Ohio state government office building across the street from the Capitol. And I thought of that before I ever did the project because I, I knew the space. And they agreed. So, you know, for two months, these guys, these addicted persons were encircling the Capitol. Yeah, that's fantastic. And it worked. Well, it Eric, worked. you know, you, you're an exceptional guy. You've got, uh, you know, a, incredible accomplishments and uh, w- very worthy of a proper memoir, which I'm excited to finish reading. Or an uh, what is your superpower? <clears throat> My real superpower is that I can spot patterns really, really fast. Um, this gives me a handle on trends, on what's going to happen. Of course, I can't tell timing or the darn. I mean, that doesn't go with the package. But yeah. I really can. Henry James calls this seeing the figure in the carpet. Okay. And that's that's my superpower is I see the figure yeah, in the carpet. Great. I see it very, very quickly. And can you give us an example? Can you give us a quick example of some time when you used that superpower and accomplished something you're proud of? Well, I've been banging the climate change drum for 30 years. I haven't gotten very far, but I keep banging on it. And that's, you know, and I read Rachel Carson in 1962 when I was on an ocean liner crossing the Atlantic. And that book stuck. Now, she accomplished something. Yeah. She got DD, got rid of DDT. You know, we have bald eagles because she was what she was. Yeah. Yeah. No Good point. Any such, any such accomplishments. Yeah. But if I you were trying to. Well, let me see. If I'm you were trying to. Okay, go ahead. As a photographer, I'm not restricted to doing glaciers and, and glacial melt. Um what I try to do with my pictures is recreate the feeling that I had when I saw things, saw the scene. And my eyesight is absolutely terrible. I mean, look at these things. You can tell they're goggles. <laughs> Which means that I see patterns and shapes much better than I see detail. And I think that combines, or maybe even partly responsible for my superpower. Yeah. Interesting. If you were trying to coach someone to better see patterns, how would you coach them to do that, to develop that ability? First of all, I would encourage them to take my course in photographic composition. Okay. Which really does does help people. Second, and it's not out there for sale. Is that it's another? I'm stupid. I do pro bono stuff. It's, hmm. You wouldn't know about that, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know something about that. The uh, so anything? Any other tips? Oh, yeah. Um, What you look for is angles and curves. What you don't want is straight lines. You don't want stuff that's bullseye composition, you know, right dead center in the frame. There are some old fashioned rules, like the rule of thirds, that are really actually helpful. Not everything has to be composed that way, but it's it's a good starting point. You know what that is? Look, imagine a tic tac toe square. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Put things on the court where at the intersections. Sure. Yeah. And that's not yeah. too complicated. Yeah. The other advice I would give would be look at the entire frame and look at the background because what you don't want is to have a tree growing out of Aunt Millie's forehead. And if because we are trained, we look at what's important to us. The camera doesn't. The camera sees what's there, period, full stop. 
So what you have to do is try as a photographer to see the way the camera sees. Look at the whole frame. You yeah. know, look at that silly looking square speaker thing on top of your bookcase. Yeah. That actually is kind of parallel in shape to your head. So I would leave that in. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Uh, well, Eric, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. We really appreciate your insights. Before we wrap up, will you take a minute and tell people how they can get a copy of your memoir, how they can learn about your Glacier show, uh, especially if they're interested in hosting it okay. somewhere? Yeah. Okay. First thing, start with the glaciers. Glaciersinretreat.com. That will show you a ton of glacier pictures, most of them retreating glaciers, but not all of them. And it will give you information on how to contact me, how to get a hold of the pictures, and so forth and so on. It has some some of the ways people have responded to them. Glaciers in retreat, all one word, dot com. I told you I can't sing. <laughs> yeah, Fantastic. Well, yes, yes, for the book, for this the memoir. Right up in your frame because it's upside down and backwards in mine. It looks great. Okay. This you can get at Amazon.com for right now. And about three or four weeks, you can get it through anything that Ingram Sparks distributes to, which is Barnes and Noble, little bookstores everywhere. My job is to get little bookstores to want to take it. And if I get good sales numbers from Amazon, that will make life easier. <laughs> Big hint. Yes, 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 yes. But it's, it's a fun book. I mean, a guy I know called Brent Bill, and I always want to reverse that. He's a writer, and he does tends to do fairly serious work. And, and he wrote me a lovely encomium saying this was, a, that means a bit of praise, uh, saying that I'm a raconteur in real life, and here I am doing it in a book. And, you know, it's a good ride, and you'll enjoy it. That's the idea. Uh, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Eric, thank you so much for being with us today. We wish you every success in your great work to fight climate change and share your story. We we want you to continue to succeed and to be around plenty long for another uh, installment of the memoir. Oh, there might be one, <laughs> but I've got to live a long time to do it. Okay. Thank you very much, Devin. It's, it's a pleasure seeing you again. Uh, thank I wish you. I had my helio. <laughs> all righty let's do some good thank you for tuning in to the superpowers for good show twice each week we host change makers who share their impact insights and superpowers don't miss another episode subscribe today at superpowersforgood.com that's superpowers number four good.com be super empowered get your copy of the book Superpowers for Good as an ebook, audiobook, paperback, or hardcover edition via your favorite online retailer. Interested in having me speak to your company, organization, or association? Visit devonthorpe.com. Then let's talk. Now, keep using your superpowers for good. Together, we can reverse climate change, improve global health, and eradicate poverty.